Okay. Uh, welcome back to us. We are here in the room. Or First lecture of the quarter, bit of a rough start, but we're, we're here. So today we'll be covering switches and, okay, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that shortly. Here's the sign-in form, so I'll give you guys a couple seconds to fill that out. Has everyone scanned the QR code? We'll come back to this slide later as well, so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, a few announcements. First, Car Ops 2 is taking place earlier this quarter. It is next week. It'll be taking place in Faraday Room. Here. Here. Um, yeah, so that'll be just like a quick hour-long-ish project. We're, we're scheduled for two hours. It should take longer than an hour. We'll basically be having you work with one of the fans. You'll, you'll, you'll see it in your kit. It's a, it's a small motor with a fan attached. We'll be having you make it spin at different speeds three different ways. That's the project. And uh, for those who haven't worked with Arduino, uh, the microcontrollers that we're using for ops uh, before, or microcontrollers in general, this is kind of the introduction to it where you can ask questions and become familiar with it before you have to do a project all on your own. Or not on your own, but have to do an actual project. Um, so if you want more experience or just to get comfortable with the Arduino, I really recommend coming to Power Ops. Also, it's not, you don't have to submit anything. There'll be a fun little quiz, but there's nothing actually commitment for this uh, event. So you can just go, show up, have fun, and leave, and no other commitments required. Um, yeah, so next week at 6 p.m. in Faraday Room. Hope you can come. Yeah, it's very much in the spirit of the first power ops, if you remember that, uh, just a short project. And yeah, this will be the first time that we're going over using like the Arduino IDE to actually create a project before you have to do that for uh, project three onwards. Okay, and speaking of project three, we need your input. So basically, we originally wanted, we usually, we usually have events for ops on Thursdays, right? But we couldn't do it this time because Adrian has a midterm or something. I don't know, something like that. <laughs> Right? Sorry, a quiz, but yeah. A quiz. Yeah, basically. Yeah, so we're gonna have to move the work session from a Thursday to a different day, but we wanted to ask you guys, what is the best day that works? So we can't do Thursday for this specific event. Um, other events will still be on Thursdays. Except for one, there's... Yeah, yeah, two, whatever, two events. Um, so we have a Monday or a Wednesday option. Um, does anyone have very strong feelings against Either of these. Yeah. I have a midterm on Wednesday, unfortunately. Bef on Wednesday? Yeah. Meaning on, by on, the on time? This date, on this date. On that date. Okay. Meaning okay. by the time it's 6 p.m., you'll be done with the midterm. Yeah, but like. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, think, think about it this way. If, it, if, if we schedule the work session on a Monday, you'll be like, oh, I can't come because I have to study for my midterm on Wednesday. That's a good idea. Okay. Right? I agree. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so so show show of hands. Oh, did someone message that we're in this room? Yeah. Okay, I forgot to think about that. Sorry. Um, so show of hands for Monday. For Monday. Okay. Show of hands for Wednesday. Okay, that's kind of the same. Yeah. Should we? Should we count it or are you guys good if we do like a poll later, like send out something like immediately after and then we just have people react? 
Yeah, have you guys yeah. Discord, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just making like, sure. Just making like, sure. Our, our I think we're probably gonna do Wednesday, Wednesday based on. Yeah. This. Yeah. But thank you. Okay. Oh, right. So, for the actual lecture, switches, signals, and iPod, we know lecture five, the first one of the quarter. I hope you guys are excited. We're gonna be talking about first signals, and then switches, and then iPod, we know as in the name. Um, so, I hope it's going to be a good time. Okay. First of all, signals. Okay, so yeah, this is kind of a review. If we actually introduced this last quarter, we're going over it kind of again because it'll be important for later projects. But yeah, so there are three types of signals. The first one is analog. These ones are the ones that actually appear in the real world. Real world. These are continuous kind of signals, things that, uh, things that are continuous with time. These include things like, uh, like sound or light or something else, something that is continuously coming in. You don't have to sample these sort of signals to actually be able to uh, see it, hear it, whatever. Um, yeah. Um, another kind of thing is that when you actually have signals in like in systems that you use, you actually have to kind of sample them. But the issue with that is that when you have things like noise, which I'll explain what that is in just a second, it can kind of mess up your data, make it make it harder to kind of extract useful information from uh, from your signals. So to give you a kind of idea, like I'll use an analogy, um, if you're in like if you're in a party with a lot of people there, and everyone is talking at once, and you want to let's say record um, what one person is saying or listen to what one person is saying, if they're talking at the same kind of volume as everyone else, you want people to hear what they're saying. If they're whispering, it's even worse. The idea is you want to keep your noise level down somehow, or be able to remove that noise entirely be able to actually hear what that one person is saying. And then we have digital signals. So digital signals are not continuous. I mentioned earlier that these are extracted by basically, if you're taking an analog signal and converting it to a digital signal, that is done via sampling. So you'll take a bunch of points and you'll say, okay, I'll, I'll kind of record the value at this time and at a later time and then continuously do that. And then you'll have an array of values that you can then use to reconstruct your original signal. Um, yeah, we won't be going over how that works, but the basic idea is just that these signals aren't continuous, and uh, when they're stored digitally, usually it'll be in the form of uh, of like ones and zeros. That's it, because when they're stored on your computer at the very lowest level, these can be things like basic electrical signals, whether a certain wire has a voltage across it or not. Hence, ones and zeros. Finally, we have PWM signals. So I mentioned this, uh, we, we covered this last time as well, so this is again just a review, but basically the idea is that if you have, let's say a wire, you can drive it high or low, and you want to be able to, let's say, reach any, okay, I'll give these concrete values. Let's say you can go zero to five volts, but you also want to be able to output any level in between, let's say three volts. One way that you can do that, aside from directly outputting three volts, let's say you're thinking only supply zero or five, is by modifying the amount of time that your signal is actually on or off, such that the average reaches the level that you want. So for example, if you want to reach 2.5 volts, then one way you can imagine doing that is by having your signal be on half the time and off half the time. And let's say that you have something that regulates the output, right? So then if you look at it over a long time, your signal is basically on half the time, or your th the wire is driven half the time, 2.5 volts, and it's zero otherwise. And so the average is 2.5 volts is the output. And so this is done by changing the voltage from zero to five very quickly so that it's not noticeable that you're changing it from zero to five to get an average of 2.5. Um, and then just some like <coughs> side thing of why we use digital, why we use continuous signals. So continuous is how we are, is basically just the signals that we see in real life, as Adrian said. But it's really hard to recreate those on a computer because that's a lot of data. So if you have a wave and you want to say, okay, I know this is a wave that represents whatever signal that I'm recording, like a voice, like my voice or something, that's a lot of points you need because it's continuous, meaning there's points at every single decimal and there's infinitely many of those, right? You can't actually ever recreate that. Um, and so on the computer, obviously you know how like stuff is represented as zeros and ones. And so digital is just a lot Digital is a, a lot cheaper, and you can do a lot more with digital on a computer because that's just how the computer is actually made. Um, and so that's why generally we, we create continuous signals, uh, at least for like using, using our Arduino uh, with digital uh, signals, but doing this funky duty cycle thing to be, have continuous. 
um, signals that are between zero and one, or between like low and high, if that makes sense. Any questions for right now? Very quick note on terminology. I realized we didn't actually tell you or remind you what PWM means. It's pulse width. It's pulse width modulation, and that kind of is uh, that kind of is hitting at the fact that you have kind of these pulses of let's say your output voltage, and you're modulating the width of those pulses, i.e. the amount of time that it's on or off, which is referred to as your duty cycle, which can be given as a ratio, the amount of time on to off, um, and that that again is modulated to kind of give you the output that you want. And that is used, again, to kind of approximate uh, analog signals and that you can reach individual values in between as opposed to just having a signal that can either be on or off. Yeah, so this is just a quick summary. We have analog, continuous signals, digital, discontinuous signals, and then what we have kind of them together is pulse width modulation. So we're not gonna be working with true continuous signals because that can't be represented. As I said, so we're gonna be, for Arduino, we're gonna have digital and Pulse width modulation. Okay, chapter two, switches. We're gonna be talking about pull up, pull down resistors, buttons, and debouncing them, whatever that means. Okay, so for switches, what you know as a switch is just the little guy, you can like press it. And if you press it, it means you connect the things so that, so that things happen. If you don't press it, nothing happens. Right? But they're actually a lot more complicated than that, and there's things you have to keep in mind, and so we're gonna be talking a little bit about that right now. Uh, so, here, sorry. What is this slide saying? <laughs> yeah, so basically, um, yeah, so the, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just tell you uh, up front, this diagram is technically wrong in actually implementing a switch, and that's, that's done on purpose. Um, for the learning. However, uh, basically the idea is that when we, when we, let's say, let's see, so the switch isn't connected right now, so you would think that because, by the way, this is just your power supply, five volts, right? So let's say that this switch is off right now, meaning it's not connected. So you would think that this should be connected to ground. That's correct, it should be reading low. But the issue is, it's not. Um, so now the question is, what's actually happening? I don't expect anyone to, by the way, like kind of know this because I don't know how many of you have tried just like, basically this happens if you like stick a wire into like one of your IO pins and then just like serial read that. And if any of you have actually done that, you might notice that it would have given you a bunch of like random kind of values. The reason for that is because this point is not at a well-defined potential. You remember that when you build like an actual circuit, you'll have, let's say your battery in the simplest case, then you'll have wires connecting that to resistors, yada, yada, some network, it'll come right back. And that creates a well-defined potential difference, i.e., let's say five volts, right? So you wanted to find a ground for that. There is a ground pin on your Arduino, it's right there, but nothing's connected. So this is reading garbage values right now. <clears throat> and so uh, some ways that we can actually modify how switches work is you can do a pull up or a pull down resistor. So essentially, um, you have, we have these two different ways that connect the button and a resistor. Uh, and normally when we think of a button, it's when you press it, it's like doing something, and when it's not pressing, it's doing nothing. So like nothing would be low, and then pressing it would be high. We can actually change it so that it does the opposite, where when you're not pressing it, sorry, uh, when you're not pressing it, it's high, and when you are pressing it, it's low. And so these are the ways that you can do that by flipping where the resistor is. And so in these diagrams, you can see that. So here we have our resistor at the top of the diagram, and the button is connected directly to ground. Um, and so in this version, it's saying that when the switch is open, as in you aren't pressing, yeah, sorry, when the switch is open, as in you aren't pressing the switch, its default is high. And so then when you actually press it, it connects to ground, and then it's low, and then the opposite for the pull down. Um, this isn't necessarily, you're not often going to be using the pull down, sorry, you're not often using the pull up one, because the pull down is one that you intuitively understand as in like you press it, and then it's on, uh, but they are a good distinction. 
Um, and as Adrian was mentioning, the problem with the circuit uh, on the previous slide was that it wasn't, it wasn't connected to ground, so it was reading garbage values. So as you can see, in these circuits, you have ground, so always remember to connect your circuits to ground um, at the end, and thus power and ground are never short-circuited uh, when, when the circuit is closed. Yeah, that's just a statement that you have. A, you do have a resistor here. Um, if you don't have that resistor, then if you actually like close the switch, then bad things are gonna happen. Just include a resistor. Just, just do. Yeah. yeah. Pop quiz. Pop quiz. By the way, um, just to make, just to kind of connect this slide to the previous slide, um, who can tell me which? Sorry, can we move to the previous slide really yeah. quickly? Um, okay. So take a look at this one. So, again, when when uh, this circuit, the way it's supposed to work, when pressed, the input is high. When not pressed, the pow uh, the input should be low. So, which of pull up versus pull down switches uh, does this circuit correspond to, or should correspond to, if it was done right? We can go to the next slide as well, just to. Yeah. Pull down. Correct. Yes. Um, and yeah, the, just to make it absolutely clear once again. The only difference between this circuit and the one on the next slide is that this one does not have a resistor here connecting it to ground. Uh, by the way, that ground should be connected to this ground eventually. That's kind of implied in these, but yeah. So when you actually do that, then when the switch is open, your, um, like this PWM pin, in that case, is still reading zero volts instead of uh, garbage. Yeah, so you can see it's the same. The button is in the same place. Okay, and so bouncy buttons, what does that mean? So our buttons aren't perfect, and what that means is that when you press it and you unpress it, it's not instantaneously going, oh, from zero to high, and then from high back to low. It's gonna be bouncy for, I guess, how that's how they want to describe it. And so there's, it needs some time to settle back to being the other state. <laughs> Um, and so, as in the name, it bounces between high and low voltages for a very small amount of time. Sometimes your button will get stuck, and so all of these are reasons why you need to debounce your buttons to ensure that it actually does what you want it to. And so, for us, the hardware version of debouncing a button is that you have a capacitor. So we haven't talked all that much about capacitors, but capacitors is that circuit symbol that's like the two parallel lines representing the two parallel plates of a capacitor in terms of the actual like physical creation of it. But capacitors just store voltage, they store energy, and they resist change, meaning that when they're at a voltage level, they're not gonna wanna change from that voltage level unless there's a good reason, uh, such as they need to discharge to keep uh, the general voltage the same. And so what that basically means is that if you connect a capacitor, usually a very small capacitor, a small farad value capacitor, farad, like Faraday room, um, sorry. <laughs> um, what that'll do is it'll make the, um, it'll make it so that the button doesn't destabilize. Uh, we're not actually gonna do this very often. We actually did in the last um, project, if you, if you remember, we had the three separate buttons that when you press them, you can make a different note. You guys remember that for project two? We actually had some capacitors at the end of our circuits. That's why we needed them, to, to be able to stabilize our buttons. Um, but starting with Arduino, we're gonna be able to just debounce them using the Arduino. Uh, so what we're gonna do is instead of just, you can press a button and then it, you have to wait for it to, stabilize, we're going to force it to stabilize by adding a delay. So whenever the button is pressed, it's going to say, okay, delay of however many milliseconds so that it has time to debounce or stabilize, if that makes sense. So you won't need to put a capacitor every single time you have a button. Does that make sense? Okay. So as I mentioned, for hardware, you have to use capacitor when the switch is open, uh, the capacitor charges, and so it charges up with voltage. Oh, yes. Okay, I'm so sorry, this is a stupid question, but why don't they just make buttons that don't delay? I mean, that's probably really expensive. Okay. To make it so that it doesn't, like, it's a lot more firm, I guess. 
if that's a, that's a weird way to put it. But in the sense of like, yeah, it's a manufacturing problem. I don't know. We have very cheap weapons. But like, is that something that like everyone deals with, or just like our kid? I would assume like all buttons. Okay. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's it's a. I, I feel like it's probably a bigger problem in more complicated circuits, especially when the components are small. They can be more sensitive to change, like like some changes in current and voltage, which will create um, kind of ripple effects throughout the circuit. Debouncing is just one of those. Yeah. I also imagine that like you want that precaution anyway, just to make sure that nothing messes up. Like for example, like your keyboard, each button is technically oh, well, it's called a button, right? Like like each key on your keyboard is a button. If you didn't stabilize it, even if it, probably it was fine, the probably sometimes that it doesn't work would be bad, right? Because like, you want your keyboard to work. I don't know. Things like that. Is the bounce like due to the physical mechanics yeah. of the contact? Yeah. Yes. You know, like it, one. it yeah. bounces, right? Like it right. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, 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 yeah. It takes some time to stop mm. bouncing, right? Yeah. Like it's also yeah, physics. it's a common problem with like cert with certain mice as well. Um, oh, yeah, like, like, like computer mice. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Just to be clear, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay, so as I mentioned, hardware, capacitor, cool. We're gonna move on to that. We don't really need to know about that. And then for the software, we're gonna have our delays. Um, this is complicated. It's doing a little bit more addition and subtraction than I wanted to. We're generally just gonna put delay open parentheses, insert number, close parentheses, colon, semicolon. That's all you're going to do, generally. Yeah. You can also reference these slides as you're like doing your project and see what they're doing in the code. The general idea of the code is just to wait until a certain amount of time has elapsed since you like press the button before like actually reading out a value. Just to let, uh, kind of let the circuit stable, stabilize. Okay. So there isn't actually that much like content, I guess, for this lecture because we were talking about iPad Nino. Uh, lecture four, the previous one where you like introduced the Arduino more, is a bit more relevant in terms of how to do um, iPad Nino. And also, iPad Nino, okay, sorry, iPad Nino doesn't have like new circuit components besides finagling with the Arduino. It's just the same buttons and resistors that we have been using. Uh, so we're going to be talking a little bit about iPod Vino and the, the knowledge you need for this project. Yeah, the main idea of Project 3 will be kind of an introduction to using the IDE. Uh, any libraries to kind of uh, create, kind of interface with like an actual circuit. Okay, so for iPod Vino, we're going to be asking you guys to become a DJ. Basically, you're going to have three buttons, like in Project 2, except that instead of each button corresponding to a different note, as in the buzzer, uh, we're gonna just correspond it to an entire song. And how's that gonna work? Well, you're gonna be coding in your Arduino IDE in C, um, such that whenever you press a different button, it's gonna correspond to a different song. So you're gonna have three songs. And a song might seem intimidating, like a song is long, it's three minutes-ish. You can do it however long you want. I think lots of people just do like, happy birthday. And then, what's a song, what's a short song? I don't know, but generally the length was like 30, 30 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> or you can, that's a pseudo from however many years ago. Um, and so yeah, each song you're, you, that you want is gonna have a minimum 10 notes, and you're gonna create a little like play function that does that for you. Uh, you're gonna have your three button hardware interface, as I just mentioned. Um, and then lastly, you're gonna have some fun with it and make it pretty and light up such that for every single different song you're gonna have, it's gonna be a different color. So it's gonna look, yeah. it's gonna look cool. Um, and so how can you do this? You might ask, what do you mean by different notes? Well, basically, remember PWM that we just talked about about 30 minutes ago? That's really important here. So with pulse width modulation, the whole concept it allows to kind of um, to kind of pause in between notes and change, basically create the song as a series of notes. Yeah. Um, why did you uh, like you use the delay to like debounce it, right? Um, wouldn't you still like send off a bunch of delays? Like how does that? 
Good question, yes. So the delays are specifically for when you actually need to read something from a button. In this case, we're assuming that the button, let's say, has already been pressed, you've decided which song to play. And at that point, it's basically up to the, um, the software to decide, okay, when am I going to send out a, like a signal versus not? So that will be supplied basically entirely through the Arduino. And in that case, we don't necessarily have to worry about the same debouncing problem just because we're not physically um, turning on or off the switch. So um, yeah, on, on the actual Arduino board, basically this code is saying, okay, this, this particular IO pin, um, it's going to be on supplying, uh, let's say, a PWM signal. Then after a delay, it'll, it'll stop, it'll be on again, stuff like that. And then versus the delay that we mentioned earlier for debouncing is if we have an external circuit connected at which point we press a button and when we're reading it, that will oscillate for a bit. So we don't run into the same kind of issues when we're purely dealing with the Arduino. Yeah, just to clarify, I think, sorry, I explained this a little wrong. Um, you do need a delay when you press a button, but this isn't occurring when you press a button. This is just a note that you're playing, right? This is like, we're playing, let's say you, you use this function play, uh, insert a note and then duration. You have, you might, let's say you play like three notes in a row. Right. The reason for these delays is not to debounce a button because we're not pressing a button when it's playing these notes. Sorry for the confusion. Uh, basically, this is the length of the note. So, if let's say I know I want to play a certain note for like a second, I know that in my song it plays that note for however long. Like it goes ah, uh, but like mm. you want that length, you want your note to be ah uh, and not ah, uh, right? You would tell it I want it to be longer by putting in that duration. And so that duration is what determines how long the note is actually played because it says, okay, it's gonna play this note and then it delays, as in it's gonna wait, so it's gonna continue playing that note for this delay until it says no more noise. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just, I just meant like everyone like heard the sound. Okay, sorry. No, you Okay, yeah. did that <laughs> clarify things? The delay stuff will make a lot more sense when you actually start doing the project because you'll find that like, at least I found that when I did the project and actually was messing with these delays, it there, there's a correct delay to use based on what your song is. Otherwise it, <laughs> it, 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 it don't sound right. Yeah. Yeah, so as I mentioned, we have the pictures.h software library. You're just gonna define it in your code. If you haven't worked with code in terms of like defining um, libraries, as in you haven't taken CS31 yet, which is per perfectly fine, um, you're just gonna put at the top, hashtag include pitches.h and it'll work fine for you. So no need to stress about that. Um, in the actual pitches.h, I think we, the file is there so you can look at it if you want to. It just has this, but like for many, many, many lines of code. Just, it defines different notes with numbers and those numbers are the frequency, right? Uh, so instead of having to write, instead of having to know note E3 is 165, you can just write note E3 because E3 is a little easier to understand if you know music um, or having to like look at sheet music, right? Um, and so we recommend that you use notes in the third, fourth, and fifth octaves. Um, octave is the number at the end, so it, has, it says C3. Uh, that's gonna be the third octave, uh, a C. If you don't know what an octave is, um, yeah, it's just a set of like eight notes on the, for those of you who don't play instruments, like the bottom, the bottom most keys correspond to like, let's say octave one, then you, let's say you start at C, then you go C here, that's your next octave, C here, and it goes higher as you go this way. Yeah, um, and so you're gonna have to download the file of pitches.h, you're gonna put it in your in your uh, folder with your project. And so this might seem, seem confusing if you haven't worked at Arduino, you don't, you don't know where the stuff is or like what to do. Come to Power Ops and <laughs> you'll get some more experience of like how to do that and it'll make more sense. But also come to the work session for project three and we can explain things if you need some more clarification. Um, and so this is an example of like where you're gonna be, like the majority of your program is to be like play note C4 4. four. Yeah. Quick note, by the way, um, up till now we haven't used the IDE, which means we also haven't explicitly told you to download it. So, so download the IDE. Yes. Yes. Um. I, I don't know if we put a link in the announcement channel or links channel, but we have the master sheet, right? The master sheet, at the top of the master sheet, uh, on the winter uh, sheet, it's gonna say, here's where to download the Arduino IDE. 
there's either either the 1.8 scene 18 or 8th 1.8 version or the 2.0 version either is fine whichever you want 2.0 is newer and auto saves that's like the only difference okay um and lastly the rgb leds now this you may be like why are we talking about this suddenly um remember when we talked about you have to make your project fancy and look fun, right? So instead of just using um, individual LEDs, the ones you've been using in your projects, you're using the RGB LED. If you came to Power Ops 1, we actually did something with this. So if you came to that, uh, you are a little familiar with it. If you didn't, that's perfectly fine. Um, and so the RGB LED is essentially everything you ever want in one LED. It has four separate pins, um, as you can see with the schematic. The longest one is going to be ground. You're going to have to connect that to ground. And then the other three co co correspond to R, G, and B. So you've probably heard of RGB like elsewhere, uh, just describing colors. R, red, G, green, blue, B is blue. And so you're going to be able to say, OK, I want specifically the R pin to be from 0. Why is it like this? From 0 up to 255, right? So that's that's the scale that the colors are for each pin, and so you're gonna you're gonna say you're gonna write to each specific leg of the LED how much R, G, or B you want, and that's gonna create a color that you want. So if you know you want to create this specific cyan, you're gonna you're gonna give it uh, 20 R, 20, 255 G, and 160 B, if that makes sense. Um, and so we have some color theory questions. If I give really high R, really high B, and really low G, what color would I get? Huh? Sorry? <laughs> <laughs> what? Purple. 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 <laughs> Purple. So that's kind of just like, that's kind of just the gist. Um, and if you have really high all three, you're going to have white. Um, hopefully that makes sense. That's, so the RGB is in terms of like light, right? If you have all the colors, you have white. If you have none of the colors, you have black. Yeah. This isn't like that important. You're just gonna choose a choose three random colors that you want. You can also just mess around with the values to see what yeah. creates what. Any questions? Okay. iPod we know. So we call it iPod we know because it's like an iPod. But Arduino. Um, so this is due the eighth, which is a number of weeks from now, three weeks from now, three weeks from now. Yeah. Um, at five fifty nine p.m. And you might ask, why is it five fifty nine p.m. instead of like eleven fifty nine? It's because this quarter we have two competitions, meaning you fight each other for prizes, <laughs> but not physically, but with your projects. So we're gonna have a project for, sorry, a competition for iPod Reno. It's gonna be at 6 p.m., hence 5 p.m. Uh, date. Uh, 6 p.m. on the 8th of February, which is another Thursday. And we're gonna be showcasing, or you guys are gonna be showcasing your songs, and then whoever has the sickest song is gonna win and get some prizes. And so the base project for iPod Reno just requires that you make a song that's minimum 10 notes. But you can go above and beyond and create a song that's longer. Uh, I don't know, something that you think is cool. And then, you know, with a little bit of just extra work, you can get prizes. Um, I really recommend doing this. It's kind of fun to just try things out and get more comfortable with the Arduino and working uh, with a little bit of coding. Um, it shouldn't be that much extra work on top of uh, the actual project. But to be clear, participating in the competition is not mandatory, but you really should because it's fun and prizes. <laughs> yeah, so that's it. Um, and of course, if you need our, yeah? I just want to ask, so when you're putting in the code for mm -hmm. your song, mm -hmm. would it be possible to layer notes to create like chords and like, stuff like that? Yeah? I guess if you use multiple buzzers, the issue is that I feel yeah. like if you, if you try to write multiple signals to a single buzzer at a time, I don't know, it's gonna blow up or something. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe try it and then. So, okay. <laughs> The answer is not with one buzzer, okay. but if you can, you have couple, like more than one buzzer in your kit. You have two, 
Or three? Two? Two? I think it's two. Yeah, one is an action. So you can create a two note chord. That's not a chord, though. Uh, but if you borrow a friend's like other buzzer, I don't know, you could, right? That would be a lot more effort. Um, but if you want to do it, I certainly recommend. You can also just like play like three notes really quickly in succession. I don't think that would like sound very good though. So, uh, yeah. Okay, so we have question marks up there because we had to ask you about when we wanted the work session. But it's gonna be on a, on a day. Probably Wednesday. There will be a project work session to be clear. <laughs> there will be one. Um, yeah, so that's it for lecture. Yeah. yeah.